Good. Welcome to the second talk of today's colloquium. And Shigeto Kawahara from KU University will introduce the speakers. Yes, my pleasure. So the second talk is by uh, Amber Libera and Ryan Walter Smith. Amber is from University of Arizona, and we learned that Ryan got a job at uh, UT El Paso. Um, so uh, when I was attending LSA this January, I was hunting for a potential speaker for this series, and, and their talk really caught my attention, was a really nicely argued uh, talk based on new field data, and I was really impressed. And they were going to present a phenological analysis uh, for which they didn't have much time. And strikingly, that's the, the, the analysis that they're proposing was very similar to what Jason Shaw and I proposed for Japanese, um, in cases where devoicing takes place. So I was very interested in hearing more about their talk. So that's why I invited them. So let's hear from them about the morphophenological evidence for onset sensitive stress in neuron osetian. All righty, going to share this PowerPoint. And okay, can everyone see and hear? Everything's good? Excellent. Yep. All righty, so uh, we will be talking about the morphophonological evidence for onset sensitive stress in Iran Osetian. Uh, I wanted to briefly give a thank you to the Iranian linguistics uh, group at the University of Arizona. Uh, their, the grant that is funding that group actually funded this project as well. And a big shout out to our uh, consultant, Valeri. All right, so the main finding or summary of this talk is that the stress system of Iran, a language that we will be discussing a little bit more background information for, has the following properties. First, it is a quantity sensitive language. Stress in this language is assigned to the leftmost heavy syllable in a two syllable window at the left edge of the word. And if both syllables in that window are light, stress will fall on the second syllable in that window. Second, there are the weight that assigns this uh, sorry, the weight sources for this system include the presence of complex onsets and the vowel quality in question. And finally, this language is coda insensitive. Codas play no role in stress assignment. Now, the big main crux of this presentation is that the weight sources we've just proposed are a problem for current typological structures and current typological uh, distributions. We are arguing that the presence of complex onsets provides weight, but the presence of simplex onsets does not, and this has an additional interaction with vowel quality. Now, onset sensitive stress system, bleh, bleh. <laughs> onset sensitive systems have been discussed in a variety of languages at this point. Uh, work done by Tvinsi, Tvinsi, and Nevins, and Gordon comes to mind. Uh, and the current literature states that languages can be onset sensitive in terms of their presence or quality of their onset. So you can receive weight based on voicing versus no voicing, or weight based on the presence of an onset versus the lack of an onset. And this is uh, a chart given by Tvinsi in uh, her dissertation in 2006. Uh, you can see that there are languages in which the presence of an onset will contribute weight, like Caro or Alabella, and you have languages in which the quality of an onset will provide weight, uh, like Pierreha, and you have languages in which both. Now, Iran is a problem for this map because Iran has to allow two consonants to provide weights and be heavier than one consonant, but one consonant is equal weight to zero consonants in the initial uh, onset position. And Tepinci actually specifically argues against this link, this type of language in uh, the 2006 uh, dissertation. So a quick roadmap of what we'll be talking about. First, I'm going to give some background on Iran Ossetian. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the sound system of Iran Ossetian. Uh, we're going to discuss the received wisdom or previous literature about stress in this language, talk about the evidence we have for its onset sensitivity, and then also provide evidence for the fact that these clusters we're going to talk about are actually clusters. Uh, following that, we'll do a Mosaic analysis and finally discuss some typological implications for this language and also discuss in general what this means. Um, just as a side note, we've done this presentation or this analysis in OT. Uh, we, we're not including our OT analysis in this talk for the sake of time, but we do have it later if you'd like to talk about it in like a Q&A session. <laughs> 
So Iran is an understudied Northeastern Iranian language. It is spoken in the Republic of North, North Ossetia Alania. This is in Russia and South Ossetia in Georgia. Uh, Ossetian has two main dialects, Iran and Digor. They are closely related. They are not mutually intelligible. And there are approximately 600,000 speakers in North and South Ossetia. Um, very few of these speakers are monolingual. Most speakers have Russian influence or are Russian bilinguals. Um, the, this is just a map of the area to give you a better idea. Uh, in this map, you see Georgia and Russia. You see the uh, diamonds represent areas in which Digor is speaking. The circles represent areas in which Iran is speaking in Russia. And the upside down triangle is the area in which Iran is, speaking, is spoken in uh, Georgia. This language has a seven vowel system uh, with some vowels that are kind of interlopers, including uh, the E eh that is from Russian. Um, we are putting it in parentheses here because it's not considered as part of the language. It is only found in borrowed words. But in general, this language has a seven vowel system with the weak vowels U uh, and A uh, and the strong vowels E, U, A, O, A. Here is the consonant phoneme inventory for the language. You have in the series of stops, a series of ejective stops. Um, you also have a series of voice stops and we have marked the voiceless stop as being aspirated. Uh, we'll discuss why in just a second. Uh, you also have a series of fricatives at the labiodental, alveolar, postalveolar, and uvular and glottal place for articulation. You have a series of affricates, including ejective affricates as well. Um, you'll notice that z is in parentheses. That is because it's spoken in decor or used in decor, but not in iron. Uh, in iron, z is produced as z. And then finally, you have nasals at two places of articulation, m mm and n. Mm. You have a lateral, a trill, and two glides, w and y. So in Iran, all voiceless stops are aspirated syllable initially, and they are released word finally. It's hard to call something word final aspirated, uh, but because it is released, we do consider it to be the same type of sound that you see word initially, or sorry, syllable initially. Uh, voiceless stops that exist in clusters are unaspirated, meaning that the elsewhere condition is the aspiration, whereas the voiceless stops appearing unaspirated in clusters is the very specific condition. Uh, gemination can occur with voiceless stops when they occur at morpheme boundaries, and finally, geminates are not aspirated. You also have palatalization and labialization in this language. All consonants are palatalized before front vowels. So for example, you get words like fietai and nyeshi and miema, which have before e, sorry, before e and e, you get the uh, palatalization. Uh, velar and uvular consonants are also labialized before the high mid vowel e. So for instance, you get words like gomas and h and kuz and gur. The syllable structure of this language uh, has a minimal lexical word of CVC. This is found by Urschler in 2018 um, and is also confirmed by the work we have done. Uh, clitics and pronouns can be CV, but they also sort of found, form part of a prosodic word in many cases. A uh, prosodic word is going to be a very useful construct, and we'll come back to that later. There are onset lists and coda list syllables allowed in this language. For instance, to and art for, have an onset list and coda list example. And initial clusters can contain no more than two consonants. So initial clusters in this language are highly restricted, even within natural classes. And I'll show you that right now. So clusters initially can contain a coronal fricative as the first sound that would include sh plus a stop, nasal, or affricate. So we've included examples of all types of clusters that we have found possible, and it is not a very full list. So for instance, you can get st and the adjective st for in something like stav and stolf. Uh, you can get shk, you can get shk, sk, and so forth and so on, including some affricates and some uh, nasals. You can also get the coronal fricative zh with a voiced stop fricative or nasal, but again, this list is fairly restrictive. You have things like zh, zhn, zhm, and shr, and that's about it. So what I wanted to point out here is that there are a lot of clusters that don't occur in the language, despite the fact that if you tried to list these, uh, generalize this to a natural class, you would expect that they would. So if you expected that sh could occur with all stops, then you would expect to see things like the series of sp and the adjective sp and sp and st, and you don't see those. Uh, additionally, you only see one sh plus an affricate. There are three that are unattested, despite the fact that they should be. Uh, you see no examples of sh plus fricatives. And if you were looking at sh plus sonorants, you might expect to see sn, sir, sol, and si, and si, 
and you see none of these. Now I want to do, I do want to point out that we are only talking about things that are created naturally in a word. We're not talking about, sorry, things that occur naturally in words. We're not talking about any clusters created from any form of affixation or morphological process. Uh, there are also a bunch of zh clusters that don't exist, including any zh plus a voiceless sound. Fine. Uh, we would also expect, to be, based on the existence of zh, as in zhuhin, that you might see zhba and zhga, but you do not see those either. Uh, and zh cannot occur with any other fricative other than r. And finally, zh does not occur with sonorants zh, zh, and zh either. So there is an additional type of cluster in this language, which contains a w, the only the glide w as the second sound. Uh, there is no cluster with y as a second sound, so I've marked these clusters as c or consonant w clusters. Uh, you'll see examples like boar and twag and dwar and dwajin and zwaf and swan, which all have a consonant plus glide as their second component. Just briefly about final clusters. Generally, final clusters cannot contain any more than two consonants. There are common clusters, including sh plus a consonant, n plus the consonant, ol plus a consonant, and er plus a consonant. Uh, clusters can have a coronal fricative and a stop. Those are very common. Uh, but CCC clusters are only allowed if they contain sh or zh in position two. So this is all to say that the final clusters are less restricted, but still have quite a few restrictions on them. And finally, the syllable breaks that we're presenting in this data today were determined by adherence to these Iran phonotactics that we've just presented, as well as the maximal onset principle, and they were confirmed by our native speaker. Our data was collected by a native speaker of Iran, and stress was determined by speaker intuition, as well as identification of acoustic correlates such as length and pitch. There was a raised pitch and lengthening of the vowels on stress syllables. And that is where I'll pass it off. Okay, thanks, Amber, for starting us off. Um, so previous work on stress in Iran has established that stress is largely determined by the quality of the vowel and the nucleus of the first two syllables in a prosodic word or potentially some larger phrasal unit. Now, the generalization is that stress falls on the first syllable if that syllable contains one of the strong vowels, so a, e, i, o, or u, uh, and on the second syllable, if the first syllable contains a weak vowel nucleus, so either a uh, or u. Uh. So just to give any, uh, some examples of this, we see on the left uh, in one words with one of the heavy syllables. So for instance, um, farasht, which means nine, uh, bear stress on its first syllable, and we could go through this whole list and see that. Now, in the second column here in two, we see words with initial weak syllables. So, for instance, umbal, the word for friend, has a uh in its first syllable, so we see stress on the second syllable, and so on. So note in particular that codas are not playing a role in the position of stress. So if we go back to farasht, we see that the first syllable is an open syllable, fa. The second syllable has the same vowel as well as two coda consonants. And yet stress is on the first syllable because the first syllable has a strong vowel. Now in the second column, we can go down, especially to the example which means publisher. We see that the first syllable, again, has, for instance, a complex coda, whereas the second syllable is an open syllable with a weak vowel, but we nevertheless see second syllable stress. So stress is falling on that second syllable, despite the fact that you might think the first syllable is heavier. So the codas aren't playing a role here. Keep going. So based on this kind of previous tradition, um, you might think that stress in Iran is straightforward. So you just say that stress is assigned to the first syllable containing a strong vowel in a two syllable uh, initial window in the word. Otherwise, stress falls on the second syllable of the word. So basically, the stress would be entirely controlled by properties of the nucleus and neither codas nor onsets play a role. So it would be a very simple system to kind of describe. 
Now we're going to show that this is not the case. So if quality alone determines where stress goes, then the stress should always be assigned to the second syllable if that first syllable contains a weak nucleus. So we're going to show some counter examples to that now. So these counter examples come from three general sources. The first source is disyllabic words uh, with initial consonant clusters in the root. The second uh, is going to be from productive morphology. And in particular, it's pluralizing monosyllabic nouns with initial consonant clusters. And then the third case is another instance of productive morphology applied to verb roots to form agentive nominalizations. And again, uh, we're going to be applying these to monosyllabic uh, verb roots with initial consonant clusters. So let's see what happens. So in Iron, verbs are generally disyllabic. So these, this is the infinitive form of the verb. And those that contain an initial consonant cluster with a weak vowel in the first syllable will bear stress on that first syllable. So in three, you see shkaren, which means to drive, and it bears stress on its first syllable, despite the fact that that vowel is weak. And we can compare this to verbs without a complex onset. For instance, the word for to fly, tahun, bears stress on the second syllable. So it follows the generalization from the previous literature. And we actually see uh, between these two columns, uh, basically a minimal pair between zhmalun, to move, with the addition of zhe, and malun, to die. So zhmalun bears stress on the first syllable, and the malun, very similar word, bears stress on the second. So plurals in Iron are generally formed by adding the plural morpheme ta at the end of the word, so it's a suffix. Some other morphophonological processes will apply sometimes. So a lot of times you see vowel reduction of a ah and o oh to a. Ah. And you also see cases of epenthesis. And these don't affect stress assignment. So the stress assignment still follows the general rules of the language. So for instance, if we see a plural stem uh, that contains a weak vowel and a simple onset, we get stress on the second syllable, as we might expect. So a note in particular, a word like marge, which means brain, the plural form of that is marge ta. So the, the plural has a weak vowel. And because of that, we get stress on the second syllable, as we would expect. And that's true for all of these forms. Now, when the first syllable contains a complex onset in addition to a weak vowel, we get stress on the first syllable rather than the expected second syllable stress. So for instance, look in five now with complex onsets. So for instance, if we see a word like stalf, which means dot, the stress is stalfita rather than stalfita. We also see words here, we're seeing words with a stop followed by a w. So a labial. So we see words like duar, and it ends up as duarta, doors. And still that stress goes on the first syllable. And so we see that plurals um, of stems with complex onsets pattern with plurals of nouns with strong vowels in their nucleus. So we can compare the column on the left with the one on the right, where we see all of these words with strong vowels in their nucleus bear initial stress, so bushta rather than bushta. And so, so far we've seen that um, CCV weak syllables, so those are the ones with complex onsets and a weak vowel in the nucleus, are heavier than CV weak or just um, onsetless syllables with a weak vowel in the nucleus. We also know that syllables with a strong vowel in the nucleus count as heavier than the CV weak syllables. But so far, we don't know how um, CCV weak and CV strong compare. And so we want to look at to see if maybe CV strong might attract stress over CCV weak. And so we'll address that issue with agentive nominalizations next. <laughs> 
So an adjunctive de-verbal nominalization takes a verbal root and builds a noun out of it. And this is someone who is either doing the action of the verb or someone who generally engages in this kind of action, so habitually. And because the uh, suffix for this, ag, has a strong vowel, we can suffix it to a variety of words and observe where the stress falls. And so again, we're dealing with roots uh, that are monosyllabic and applying something to it to see where the stress goes. So we can start out with our um, weak syllable ones with a simple onset. So we get words or roots like tuch. When we add og on, we get tachag. In this case, the stress goes on the second syllable, and that's true generally for um, roots with this shape. Now, again, as we expect from the previous literature, if we apply og to a root containing a strong vowel, the stress falls on the first syllable. So we get kafag, someone who dances habitually, and so on for this class. Now here's the kicker. If we take verb roots that have a kind of native um, complex onset, then we still see initial stress. So shkarag, shkafag, zhmalag. So here, um, the stress is not shifting onto the syllable with the strong vowel. It's going on the first syllable with this um, complex onset and weak vowel. So this tells us that CCV weak syllables are at least as heavy as syllables with the strong vowel nuclei. So if a CCV weak syllable precedes a CV strong syllable in that um, two syllable window, we get stress on that first syllable. And so we have a few generalizations. So we've shown that stress in Iran has three properties. So we already we already knew about its sensitivity to nucleus quality. So that was the issue with uh, the weak vowels um, not bearing stress when they're first, strong vowels bearing the stress when they are in that first position. But we also saw that onset complexity plays a role here. So when there are two consonants in the onset of the first syllable, the stress falls on that first syllable regardless of properties of the nucleus. And so we also saw a bit that um, there's this insensitivity to coda complexity. So we saw that um, it didn't matter if, for instance, a syllable had a complex coda. If it had um, a weak vowel in its nucleus, we're still going to see the stress go on the second syllable. So we see that CV weak syllables are light, and we can class CV strong and CCV weak syllables together as heavy. And so just to throw this in here so that it's kind of apparent, um, we're dealing with a phenomenon that is sensitive to prosodic words um, and potentially a larger phrasal unit. So expressions that contain multiple lexical words that will act as a kind of single prosodic domain um, will behave like a single word for the purposes of stress assignment. So we can see in uh, complex predicates where um, the verb is kind of composed of a verbal portion and a nominal portion that the stress will fall on the first syllable of the whole thing if it's a strong vowel and on the second syllable otherwise. We also see this effect in uh, possessed to noun phrases. So for instance, farat has second syllable stress, but when you add in a possessive clitic at the beginning, that stress falls on the first syllable of farat because it's the second syllable overall. And so the stress system we the system we presented so far looks kind of clean, but you might try to propose a counter analysis. So the idea that we're pursuing here is that this is onset sensitive stress. So stress that is sensitive to a complex onset. But one possibility that you might try to explore is that the clusters are actually heterosyllabic. So these initial constant clusters are in fact split. So the first C forms the nucleus of its own syllable. So the first syllable contains a strong vowel, 
then it's stressed, but then you can save the original generalization from the previous literature and try to say that this is still second syllable stress because that first syllable actually just has no vowel in the first place. And so I'll pass it back to Amber um, to uh, who will try to tell us how we try to control for this possibility. Thank you. So in order to test whether clusters are heterosyllabic or belong with the a single syllable, uh, we wanted to look at a preverb that is very common in this language, and that preverb is shh and shh alone. Uh, this is a preverb that is used in a variety of contexts. Uh, it is used for a directional, meaning upward. It can also be used as an emphatic, and I believe it's usually used with an emphatic when there's focalization or topicalization. Uh, and it can also be used as the perfective marker, uh, in addition to another perfective marker, ba. Oops. So the key point here is that sh resembles clusters that are already allowed in the language. So we can observe the behavior of this preverb sh compared to the behavior of clusters that happen naturally within words and see what happens. So first observation we have is that sh is always stressed. Uh, when it is affixed to an onset list syllable, especially one that has a weak vowel in the first syllable, like a verin, which has originally second syllable stress because the first syllable contains a light vowel, you see shavarin with initial stress. So despite the fact that there is a weak vowel and a simplex onset, you do see stress on that first syllable because of the prefix sh, which has this property that it is always stressed. If you affix it to a light syllable with an onset, it will result in a cluster and that cluster is stressed. So something like tchen, which has second syllable stress, becomes shtachen, which is first syllable stress. Third, you do start to see epithetic vowels when you use this preverb, and they occur when you affix the uh, preverb to a, a, a stem that already has a cluster, like zhduhen. And in this case, you would get first syllable stress again on shzhduhen, despite the fact that the first syllable contains a weak vowel and the second syllable contains a strong vowel. And finally, and most fun, uh, in cases of compound verbs, like the verb to go on a hunt, uh, let me break down this verb for a second, actually. The first part of this verb is swan, which means hunt. It has the suffix e, which means uh, it's a preposition to, to right? Um, then you have the verb sawun, which is to go or to go or to do. So swan is sawun is to go on a hunt. Now, when you affix the sh preverb to this verb, it attaches uh, between swan and sawun and resyllabifies as a coda. So phonetically, you get the word swanish sawun. And despite the fact that it's a coda in this case, it still attacks stress, especially attracting stress over an initial syllable that has a cluster, swa, and has a strong vowel. So altogether, sh is always stressed. The second observation we have there here is this cluster appendicis that I mentioned on the previous page or on the previous slide. So when sh is affixed to a word with a cluster, an epithetic u uh is inserted. And that u uh is always inserted directly following the uh, preverb sh. So in a word like skaren, which is to investigate, you would get shushkaren with the u uh following the, the first uh, preverb sh. In a word like Zhroren, you get shzhroren, which means to run upward. Uh, you also see this in complex onsets with weak vowels. It is the same regardless of what the vowel is in the syllable. Uh, simply stated, whenever there is a cluster that is in the beginning of the word, you will see an epithetic sh inserted between the preverb and the cluster. Now, I should note that this epithetic u uh, never falls in the middle of the natural cluster. It always falls between the natural cluster and the preverb. Our third observation is that when you affix, you can get all sorts of clusters if you affix this to a word that has a uh, initial simplex onset, and that these clusters are unrestricted. So when you affix clusters to certain words, you will get uh, clusters that are acceptable in the language, including things like stochen and stuchen and and sorry, schkannen and schkaffen. Those are all absolutely fine. Uh, they are phonotactically acceptable for this language, but you also get a whole bunch of clusters that are phonotactically unacceptable, going back to that slide that I talked about where you have all sorts of things that might be attested, but are actually unattested if you look at the data for natural clusters. So 
despite the fact that the does never happen, will never happen as a natural cluster, you will get examples like Staven, which has that sh plus a d. You can also get sh adding to any sorts of all sorts of fricatives like schfussen and schvildachen and schsoen, which has a sh plus a s. And uh, in certain cases, that sh plus will actually reduce and become a geminate sh, as in the case for so when to go becomes sh, sorry, sh so when. Um, but in some cases, like the word, like the verb to sip, summon, uh, you never get reduction to a geminate. So that word is always summon. So there are no real phonotactic restrictions on the type of clusters that can occur uh, when you have the preverb, whereas natural clusters are highly restricted. And even within natural classes, several types of sound combinations just cannot occur. Our final observation, number four, is that aspiration occurs with preverbs, but it does not happen in natural clusters. So this is an example of a natural cluster. It has a voiceless stop in the word stug, so that is uh, a uh, sh followed by a t, and this is the word for bone. And if you look, the aspiration uh, is highlighted, and it is about 16 milliseconds, not very much at all. Compare that to the aspiration in a word like stahin, which is much, much, much greater. So this is a voiceless stop that is, sorry, this is a cluster that is created through uh, prefixation. It means the verb to fly up, so it has that sh prefix plus the word tahin which is to fly. And you see that it has a much greater amount of aspiration here than in the previous examples. So our analysis is that natural clusters form onsets of the relevant syllable. So speakers of your own consider natural clusters to be quite different than those that are produced by affixation. Uh, sh appears to head its own syllable in a way that many have proposed um, natural clusters might in order to resolve this onset sensitive stress issue. Um, and the reason we say it appears to head its own syllable is that, first of all, it's always stressed. There are no phonotactic restrictions on its placement compared to stems, and it doesn't interact with aspiration of following segments. On the, on the other side, if you look at natural clusters, there are severe phonotactic restrictions on what is allowed, and there is never aspiration. So there is interactions between the two sounds that are involved in a cluster. Uh, in addition, a penthesis is used to avoid CCC clusters, but it will never split a natural cluster. It always splits the preverb uh, from the natural cluster. So in summary, natural clusters don't seem to follow the same pattern as this preverb sh and therefore natural clusters are more likely to form the onset of their relevant syllable rather than being heterosyllabic. So just to briefly talk about one of the types of clusters we've already mentioned, which are the CW clusters. Uh, these clusters do something weird when you do uh, prefixation. So we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about that for a second. So there are several types of clusters as I've already mentioned that have this wa in the second position, like wa, twa, dua, nua, and swa, as in wa, twa, dua, nua, jin, and swa, ni, so when pluralized, these clusters do behave as expected, as we've shown previously. Uh, you get boar, and that is pluralized into buerta with first syllable stress. So despite the fact that it has a weak vowel in the initial syllable, you do see stress on that syllable. And uh, this pattern holds for all of the examples we've included here. Now, I just wanted to reiterate something that Ryan said in his slide is that the stress assignment here does not occur because of some natural tendency of stress to fall on a uh, reduced off, for instance. So there is a strong vowel in the initial syllables of these words, as in boire, does have a. Um, and when it's reduced, there might be an argument that the reduction causes borta to get first syllable stress, despite the fact that it is now a weak vowel. But if you compare it to words like calm, which is the word for snake, you get kalmita with second syllable stress. So the redu reduced a does not bear stress uh, in that case comparing that comparatively to the cases where you also have a cluster in the beginning. However, when you do sh prefixation on these types of words, you get no epithetic vowels inserted. So for instance, the word nuajin, which means to drink, has the prefixation, sorry, the prefix form schwajin with a CCC cluster, which means to drink upwards. So there are three possible explanations for this. One is that wu is actually a labialized consonant that I talked about previously, and it's not actually a cluster. The second explanation could be that wu syllabifies as part of the nucleus and is not actually a consonant. It's actually part of a diphthong. 
Or third, clusters with will can have different phonotactic rules from, from clusters that have a coronal fricative. So uh, the first explanation can pretty much be thrown out because labialized consonants don't attract stress, but CW clusters do. So we have several examples here of pluralized uh, labialized consonants that do not attract stress to their first syllable. Uh, they are labialized consonants plus a weak vowel. So something like hu, which is pig, is huta with second syllable stress, and so on and so forth. So you get guol and guolta with second syllable stress. So they do not attract stress uh, at all. Labialized consonants also only occur before u, uh, and only velar and uvular sounds are labialized. And these CW clusters that we've been looking at uh, occur before a uh and an u uh, rather than before u, uh, and they include sounds that are not velar or uvular. So it's very unlikely that we could call these labialized consonants. So we have bo, dua, schwa, and none of these are velar or uvular sounds. And in addition, as I said, they occur before a uh and u. Uh. So it's very unlikely that these are labialized consonants. They occur before different vowels. They are not restricted to uvular and velar consonants. And labialized consonants don't attract stress, but CW clusters do. So the second explanation is that these CW clusters could be diphthongs. And our consultant is kind of the impetus for this argument because he calls them a diphthong. Uh, so if these sounds are actually diphthongs, we could see initial stress, not because it's a cluster, but because there is a heavy nucleus, similar to what you would see with a strong vowel. So to evaluate this, we were going to look, we're going to examine data that contains simple wa onset with no cluster and see what happens. Because you would expect that if it was a diphthong, you would get stress on that syllable. If it is not a diphthong, you wouldn't. And what we see is that words with initial wa and weak vowels actually get stress on the second syllable, not the first. So you get waruk and watur and waluma and so forth and so on, which have a stress on the second syllable. Stress is not attracted to wa plus a, meaning that this is likely not a heavy nucleus. So we can look at these possibilities in a different way. So if wa is not a diphthong naturally, it could be the case that it simply has syllabification options. So wa can syllabify as either part of the nucleus or part of the onset. So if it becomes an onset, sorry, if there is no other onset present, wa becomes part of the onset and you have a simplex onset and a weak vowel and that does not attract stress. However, otherwise, if there is an onset, wa can syllabify as a diphthong and be part of a heavy nucleus. The final option is that there might be simply special CW consonant wa phonotactic restrictions. So these clusters do contain a glide and there are no examples of coronal fricatives and glides other than the ones that we've seen already. And so they might have different phonotactic restrictions and CCC is possibly allowed to occur if one of the Cs is a glide. However, it's pretty impossible to separate these possibilities based on our data. If the cases that wa has syllabification options, you would expect to see no restriction on CCCs when the preverb is added because wa is not a consonant. You would also, or sorry, it's part of the nucleus. You would also expect to see plural nouns receiving first syllable stress because it's a heavy syllable diphthong, uh, heavy nucleus diphthong. Uh, you would also expect that simplex wa with an onset with a weak vowel would not receive stress because in that case you have a simplex onset and a weak vowel. If there are special phonotactic restraints on CW, you would expect to see no restriction on CCC when the preverb is added because it's allowed. You would expect plural nouns to receive first syllable stress, and you would expect simplex wa onsets with a weak vowel to not receive stress. So they have exactly the same outcome. The only point in favor to the second explanation rather than the third is that we never see CCC clusters as a natural cluster in the language. And you might expect that if there were special phonotactic restrictions that we would, but not necessarily. So as a quick interim summary before we get into the last piece here, uh, clusters in this language are syllabified as part of the initial syllable. They are monosyllabic. They belong to the onset of one syllable. There are two types of clusters. There are coronal clusters and uh, CW clusters, of which CW clusters are potentially positionally ambiguous. And syllables with onset clusters and strong vowels or diphthongs are considered heavy, while simplex onsets do not contribute weight. Stress is assigned to the leftmost heavy syllable in the stress window, and if both syllables are light, stress is assigned to the second syllable in that window. And Ryan will take it over. All right, thanks. So I'll try to go through this quickly. I know we're running a little low on time. Um, but based on the previous generalizations that we've made here, as well as what we knew from the previous literature, we can paint 
you don't as a quantity sensitive system with the following characteristics. So we're going to analyze uh, strong vowels as bimoraic, weak vowels as monomoraic, and we'll say that C onsets, so simplex onsets don't project a mora, but complex onsets do. So we get um, we get a mora for the additional onset constant in a weak vowel uh, with a weak vowel. And so this kind of ties together two classes that we had. So CV weak syllables are light, so they're monomoraic. CV strong and CCV weak syllables are heavy, bimoraic. And so this gives us a bit of a handle on word minima in the language. So words with one heavy syllable. Um, so the minimal word is basically bimoraic is what we're claiming. So we do see words uh, with the CCV weak syllable pattern. We see, of course, CV strong. And we also see words consisting of two light syllables. So CV, CV, two more words. So we do see uh, CV weak words uh, without a uh, coda, um, but that you only see them as kind of clitic pronouns. So something that's kind of glomming onto something else. So either a clitic pronoun or like the copula. So these will form part of a whole prosodic word. But the issue is that you also see um, CVC weak words in Iran. So in these cases, um, you wouldn't expect this to be a possible word if, if codas don't count. And so we can propose that codas kind of as a last resort um, can be moraic in order to satisfy word minima. And so in kind of a, uh, an OT approach that we've developed further um, below, uh, we won't have time to talk about it, but we can talk about it in the questions. Basically, you would just rank um, the grammatical word equals prosodic word over uh, a constraint penalizing moraic codas. So in just that instance where you need to satisfy the, prosodic, the minimal word requirement, um, you can treat the coda as moraic. And you do see this in other languages. So there are languages like Bellacula, where um, CV is allowed and basically onsets. The idea here is that you can treat an onset as moraic in order to satisfy this word minimal requirement. And so it's the same idea. So we do see CCV strong syllables in Iron. So these would be basically super heavy for us. Um, but you don't see them very frequently. So you see them uh, as the first syllable or in monosyllabic words. And in fact, certain morphophonological processes will kind of target these and make them kind of smaller. So this is the part that I'm gonna go through relatively quickly. Um, so weight based on onset prominence is kind of well attested at this point. So you see a bunch of examples. Piraha is a famous example. Um, now those that are based on kind of onset complexity have also been observed, but they've been questioned and kind of uh, deconstructed. So in particular, the argument from Nankina where CCV has been claimed to be uh, heavier than a, um, a syllable that has either a simplex onset or no onset at all. Um, but basically Topinsi specifically argues against um, this kind of situation. Go ahead, Amber. So for Bislama, Topinsi cites issues regarding syllabification choices and then the lack of examples and in fact, um, there's been other work that suggests that onsets, in fact, don't have an effect on stress after all. And for Nankina, we see um, that true complex onsets may not actually occur, and that word initial CC is actually split by a transitional vowel. So this is what you see in Nankina. We haven't found evidence for this in Iran. Go ahead. And so a couple of other cases have also been claimed to exist. Amber, can you change the slide back? Apologies. OK, well, that's OK. So, um, so basically, none of these cases provide unambiguous proof for 
onset complexity um, providing weight while well, simplex onset doesn't. Um, now for a setian, we think that this is a rel this is a much stronger case. So Tapinsi actually her generalization states that um, this sort of pattern shouldn't exist in the first place. Uh, so syllables with one coda or onset are light, while syllables with a cluster or heavy shouldn't happen. And these are based on um, certain constraints um, about basically saying have a moraic onset or have a moraic coda. Um, and so it's actually impossible to allow complex onsets or codas to become moraic without also allowing the singleton onsets or codas to be moraic. And so Iron is an example of a language that actually goes against Topinci's uh, approach. Um, and it also has this additional interaction with vowel quality. Now, weak vowels in Iron were originally called weak because they have a tendency to delete and reduce. And this is true synchronically, but also diachronically. And so, um, for instance, the preverb that we talked about previously originally had a vowel before it. So rather than just sh, it was ish. And so a lot of Iranian languages also assign stress to preverbs. So we saw that sh kind of carries this inherent stress on it. Um, at some point, this u was lost. And because of its stress property, sh affixation results in these kind of this attraction of stress. And so one possibility is that this um, pattern arose diachronically. Um, it's possible that the clusters uh, generated from the preverb kind of got analogized across all clusters. Uh, it's also possible that a lot of these clusters originally had initial vowels, but they dropped off over time. And so that could lead to a diachronic pathway for this sort of system to arise. Okay. So just to briefly kind of discuss what we've talked about. So Iron onsetian stress is sensitive to onset complexity as well as the nucleus quality, um, but not sensitive to um, coda, the properties of the coda that provides a challenge for previous work. So these previous approaches can account for systems where the presence of an onset affects syllable weight, but not for the case in which complex onsets count for weight, but simplex onsets do not. And so for Iron, um, this kind of motivates an extension of proposed possible typologies in order to account for this. Um, and this will, these will have constraints that kind of force moraic structure to be assigned to complex onsets, but not to simplex ones. And if you want to talk about how that works out analytically, we can work through some tableau here in the question period. Okay. Yeah, and so just as a final note, we also kind of want to look at this from a diachronic perspective. So we provide an, an analysis in OT, but we might be able to get a handle on how these sorts of systems arise more generally if we consider uh, if we consider them across time. All right. So thank you. We would also like to acknowledge our. Um, our research group, which we did at the beginning, as well as Valeria Zusati, who is our consultant. Thank you. So we have a question uh, from uh, Manami Hirayama. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, um, I'm very interested in the clusters, the constant clusters. So uh, that was one reason why I find it very interesting. I just have a, a question. So you mentioned actually at the very uh, uh, end of your talk, uh, the diachrony of the language and, and uh, that kind of made sense to me because when I was uh, following your talk, I was thinking maybe you could analyze the CC cluster as sort of a CV, uh, C, uh, cl uh, not cluster, but sort of uh, two um, CVs or uh, anyway, a vowel between the cluster. And then you don't need to have this uh, more like uh, onset consonant maybe, uh, maybe in the government uh, phonology type of uh, analysis might allow that. Uh, 
Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, so I'll go first and Amber can jump in. So we presented this um, for a few folks who are kind of um, working in government phonology and this is kind of the first thought that they present is actually um, there's either either an empty like vowel um, in the initial in that first part actually breaking up the cluster um, or there's something else going on there and so um, diachronically so some of these words that we've presented here did um, over a hundred years ago have an initial schwa um, mm -hmm. or an initial weak vowel. Uh, and so that would lead to, so in when those forms looked like that, they actually followed the original generalization where um, you just put stress on the second syllable, the first syllable was weak. Now, so that, that style of analysis could work for the kind of um, coronal fricative clusters. Um, However, I've not seen similar diachronic evidence um, for a kind of bisyllabic origin for the CW clusters, which also attracts stress. And so, so diachronically, I don't know that that um, has a common origin. Now, synchronically, if you are working in a government phonology framework, I think you certainly could posit um, like empty nuclei and basically you could treat Ossetian as a fixed stress language. I just want to add, um, you would have a more difficult time explaining the distribution of uh, aspiration, uh, for instance. So if you had an empty nucleus, you would expect to see a similar pattern to what you see with the sh prefixation uh, with that preverb where you'd have the second sound if it was a voiceless stop aspirate. Sure. Sorry, aspirated. Um, but you don't see that. In fact, mm -hmm. you see that the presence of those two things together affects how the second sound is produced, which I would, I mm -hmm. would find difficult to explain uh, if there was an empty nucleus there. So the, the phonotactic system seems to argue that these things are clusters uh, more likely than they are uh, somehow have two syllables, uh, even if uh, diachronically there is an explanation of them starting out as bisyllabic and then resyllabifying. I see. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if uh, you have any other questions or comments, please send me your name and affiliation. So I, I have actually, like in the onset, uh, your system, you did analyze your system as heavy. It's uh, argued one of the thing is like not, it's not cumulative, right? So uh, having one uh, onset is zero and having a cluster will contribute to the onset. Uh, yes. In the CODA, uh, like stress and CODA system, I, I think uh, it's also, it's an interest, I, I guess the, the, uh, the system is usually if the coda, if one coda contributes to the weight, two codas will not suddenly make it super heavy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I was wondering whether you have any thoughts about this, like seeming it, symmetry between these two <laughs> things. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it might help explain, uh, we don't seem to see super heavy syllables um, I mean, we see them, but we don't see any evidence that they're doing anything. And that's partially because they're word initial. And so if they were doing anything, they would attract stress anyway, because the leftmost syllable is going to get stress that's heavy. Um, but it may explain why, say, you know, a strong vowel plus two consonants, which should be super heavy, wouldn't. Uh, maybe it has similar properties of, you know, adding that extra weight doesn't, you know, add extra moras. Um, so, uh, yeah. And we almost have the opposite problem, right? So adding, so adding one does nothing, but adding two does something instead of adding one does something and adding two does nothing. Um, I don't know, those are. I will say that, um, so this isn't necessarily about super heavy syllables, um, but you do see at least there, there was claimed to be some evidence that you do have kind of a mirror system to what we presented for Ossetian where you have um, like CVC syllables count as light, but CVCC count as heavy, for instance. Um, I think Malayalam was originally claimed to be like that. I don't know if that claim holds up, um, but, uh, and I think that comes from Hayes's, like, his dissertation or his, um, his um, book on metrical stress theory. But 
It yeah. is notable that Tepinsi argues against this happening in both onsets and codas. So both mm. of these languages, so Iran shouldn't have this system and any system that has something similar in the coda is also a suspect. Um, so, but if it exists for Iran, it makes the typological claim that it can possibly also exist in a coda language as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, Shigeto has uh, a quick question, I guess. Yeah, yeah is it okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so I was really interested in the Moraic structures that you propose on slide 62. Um, yeah. So generally, people do not associate onset consonant with a mora, right? That's the right. classic haze. Yeah, thing. that's true. Um, but for Japanese, people think do think that CV is one one mora. Mm -hmm. And um, when th there's a devoiced vowel, the, the structure at the bottom is what I propose. So this really intrigues me. Do you have reasons to like um, associate the onset consonant to a mora in the middle panel? Yeah, so this was kind of, um, this, I guess this was theoretically motivated. So if we wanted to look at our, so we have some tableau. Amber, do you actually want to go down to those? So our idea was essentially that we needed to parse all of our segments into, into Mora. So we had a constraint that was like parse Mora, I think. Um, and so in that case, what we did um, instead, of, so this, we called it attached Mora here. So, um, so what this basically does was that it drives all of the segments to associate to some kind of structure. So in this case, a Mora. Um, and so we took advantage of this to um, also kind of drive the association of the additional uh, onset consonant. So Amber, if you want to go down to the CCV weak analysis. Yeah, so the point of this was to basically drive association of the, of the first C with its own mora, which will get us a case where CCV weak counts as bimoraic, uh, basically treating mm -hmm. it in line with the strong vowels, which also get um, two moras. I think there is a theoretical difference between saying that, say, for instance, in the third uh, option down, the comparison between two Cs attaching to one mora and one vowel attaching to one mora. There's a theoretical difference um, that we didn't maybe didn't fully investigate here. Um, but this, based on our OT analysis, was the easiest way to consistently structure them the way we expected to get bimoraic uh, weak syllables, sorry, bimoraic syllables with a complex onset and a weak vowel. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Let me add one thing. It's interesting what Shigeto just raised because when I worked on my dissertation or to explain the consonant tone interaction, Basically, I was proposing similar kind of uh, situation where the consonant has a mora, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, basically the absence of faithfulness for these moraic structure uh, associated with consonants will result in consonant tone interaction. Uh, so only the markedness constraints are basically uh, controlling for that. So uh, I, I even call it with the suggestion of my uh, advisor at the time, extended TBU theory, like, uh, <laughs> uh, calling it like every every segment has mora, but like uh, the consonant ah. moras, consonantal moras uh, don't survive because uh, they are, uh, in most cases, markedness constraints will not allow them, uh, but, uh, and they, they are no faithfulness constraint in the system that would ever uh, have any contrastive uh, tone-based uh, system in particular. That was about tone, so uh, it's a little bit different from the stress, but maybe you can have a... Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm interested in checking that out. Thank you. So, yeah, that's a great way to uh, get at the same issue. Yes. So, so I'm, yeah, I was interested, excited about this. <laughs> <So> good. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So good. Uh, let's uh, wrap up the uh, session before we uh, um, uh, continue a little bit more discussion afterwards. Uh, so uh, 
Let me uh, thank uh, Amber and uh, Ryan one more time. And uh, I would like to thank the assistant, uh, Yuki Baldoriau, uh, who was uh, behind the force of uh, running the event today. Also, thanks to the co-host Shigeto Kawahara. Uh, this event was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at Keio University and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. Uh, the next talks of uh, uh, this KO ICO link series, uh, season four, uh, will be uh, delivered by Jenny Balick from University of California, Santa Cruz, and Hannah Sandy from UC Berkeley. And uh, we ha also have a separate series running uh, for ICU link, and that's uh, different um, uh, areas of linguistics. On May 8th, uh, the, it's a Saturday, uh, Rajesh Prat from UMass and Michael Yoshitaka Orwin from National University of Singapore will present their work. So uh, thank you all who participated in today's colloquium. Either we will see at uh, on May 8th or uh, next time when uh, on May 10th, uh, when we have the uh, second part of KOIC link. Thank you. Uh, the recording will now start.